today is on internet exceptionalism and intermediary deputization. Um, this is a, a major section, a major portion of the Next Digital Decade book with uh, some really impressive contributions on what has been, from the start, one of the most contentious set of, sets of issues regarding uh, cyber law and internet policy in general. Um, this question of uh, exceptionalism and should we treat the internet differently than other previous types of communications or media uh, technologies or mediums. And then the question of intermediary deputization, which has been uh, a hotly contested matter of law for many, many decades in many, many fields, but has really become even more uh, contested in the internet space since we have a very unique uh, framework or paradigm for intermediary liability for the internet because of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So that's what we're going to be discussing today and what the, uh, the folks here on the panel all have contributions to the book uh, on this matter. Um, let me run down uh, our esteemed panel, and uh, it is a really impressive one. Um, we're going to hear today from uh, Eric Goldman, who's an uh, associate professor of law at Santa Clara University uh, School of Law and director of that uh, university's high-tech law institute. Um, Eric is... Uh, probably uh, the nation's leading expert on Section 230 matters. And if you don't read his blog regularly to, to find out the sort of daily dish on 230, uh, <laughs> then, then you're really missing something because uh, it's the absolute best free resource on the internet for uh, cyber law geeks. I'm like Perez Hilton for 230. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, we also have um, uh, Professor uh, H. Brian Holland here, who's uh, joined the faculty of Texas uh, Western School of Law in 2009. Uh, Prior to that, he was a visiting associate professor at Penn State University's Dickinson School of Law. And he has a terrific chapter in the book about internet exceptionalism that uh, is really one of a kind. I, I found it uh, a couple years back and was really impressed by it and told Baron it really has to appear in this book, in this collection. And uh, uh, we're going to hear from Brian about that in just a moment. We'll also hear from uh, Josh Goldfoot. Josh, Josh, right there. Um, he's a senior counsel with the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section of the U.S. Department of Justice. And I know, uh, I should stress here, he's speaking in his private capacity only and not for his employer or his co-author for the chapter in the book, Judge uh, Alex, Alex Kaczynski, who's a judge of the Ninth Circuit. But they've, uh, they've contributed a, a wonderful essay, sort of uh, a contrarian view of, of some of this in Internet that in just a moment. We uh, are also joined by Mark McCarthy, who has probably more uh, real-world hands-on experience dealing with in intermediary liability uh, and deputization issues than just about anybody else. He, uh, he, teaches in, he currently teaches uh, and conducts research at Georgetown University's Communication, Culture, and Technology program, but in, uh, in another life, uh, he was Senior Vice President for Global Public Policy at Visa, uh, where he, uh, again, dealt with uh, all of the matters we're going to be discussing here today and uh, has a wonderful lengthy contribution to the book, which uh, goes through a, a history of all these things and these issues. And then finally, again, we're joined by Frank. Frank Pasquale is up here, and uh, he's, again, uh, with Seton Hall uh, Law School and a visiting fellow at Princeton University's Center for Information Technology Policy. Um, and Frank's going to be discussing some of the issues uh, from his chapter, uh, I hope, uh, in the book that uh, dealt with uh, the question of search and uh, online liability in that context. And uh, 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 even potentially a federal search commission uh, for the internet. <laughs> so uh, let's get started. I think I'm going to turn to Eric first. And as I do, um, I'd like it if each of you can just maybe say a brief word about your contribution or contributions, plural, as the case may be, to the book. Uh, but obviously, specifically, why they're relevant to this topic of internet exceptionalism or intermediary deputization. Eric? Uh, yeah, thank you, and I'm so glad to be here, and um, this has been such a delight to participate in the book uh, project and uh, to be a part of the uh, program, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I have two relevant contributions here. Uh, I wrote one, uh, an article called The Third Wave of uh, Internet Exceptionalism, where I give a short treatment of how I think we've actually gone through three different waves of uh, thinking about it. One of the things, uh, in preparing for this, reading the, um, the book chapters, um, I noticed that we were using the term exceptionalism for different purposes. Um, on this one, I was talking strictly about how the law might regulate the internet differently than it does other media. Um, and we started out in the uh, mid-1990s with a um, approach of um, giving the internet specialized treatment um, uh, favorably because um, we knew we would screw it up. 
um, than turning and saying, uh, well, actually, let's go ahead and just screw it up. Um, <laughs> to the third way, which is, I'm actually, what I've noticed is a fracturing of internet exceptionalism. We're now seeing various types of uh, sub-communities within the internet that are uh, themselves being subject to unique um, regulation. I've recently done some research, for example, on uh, internet dating sites. And we have a whole raft of laws that are coming out about internet dating sites as a subset of uh, the internet community. We've, we think we can carve out this little piece and treat it different from the rest of the internet and different from the rest of the world. And so um, I see exceptionalism as proliferating, that we're having multiple versions of it. Um, I, I'm going to take whatever balance of time I have in these intro remarks to talk about um, uh, some perspectives on uh, 47 USC 230, uh, which, uh, as Adam indicated, is something I think a lot about, uh, spend a lot, a lot of time. And we are having a conference that was already referenced on March 4th. I'm happy to give you guys pointers to where it is. But we're going to have a true geek on geek event to talk about 47 USC 230. We're not going to uh, start with the premise, let's talk about cyber harassment or let's talk about uh, online ills. We're going to start with, let's talk about statute. And we're going to anchor a bunch of things off of that. Um, and from my perspective, um, I see um, uh, 230 has really having been um, one of the few things Congress really did get right. And uh, I spend so much time on my blog bashing legislators for screwing things up. Um, and so I'd like to point to something that they actually got right. And as I think about what's going on in Silicon Valley, and I think about um, the level of entrepreneurship there, I've seen just an explosion of interest in ways that we can um, develop uh, new sources of user-generated content, new ways of um, presenting that user-generated content, and then um, new ways that people can tap into this uh, new source of information to uh, uh, build upon them. And um, uh, to me, I don't know how to define it as truly different than anything I've ever seen before, but it feels different. Well, let me just take it as far as that. Um, that we've got something unique really going on with user generated content. And so much of the experimentation and entrepreneurship that we're seeing is taking place because there's this huge liability umbrella that sits over the entire industry and says, you can go ahead and experiment and try things that you've never tried before. And don't worry if you're not marching to the industry standard because you're not going to be liable whichever direction you choose to go. If you're dealing with user content and you have a new approach, the liability lets you experiment with that. And to me, I've seen people who are trying all kinds of neat, interesting, different things, things that we might not have thought would ever be explored. Um, and to me, so many of those take place only because people are worried about how to manage their liability and reduce their risk. Um, let me leave my remarks there, and I'm sure I'll have more to say later. That's great, Eric. And let me turn to Brian Holland now, because I think his remarks and a lot of what we found in his chapter in the book is going to build nicely off of what Eric just had to say. So Brian, take it away. First of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, my chapter sort of divided between two things, and sometimes I think of them as two different parts of the article, uh, two completely different articles. The first is sort of tracing the history of cyber libertarian uh, exceptionalism and its various uh, ebbs and flows. And the second half, and the part I'm going to concentrate on, is um, I, I feel odd to be two people on a single panel defending Section 230. That never happens. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, my, my uh, chapter is really about a defense of 230. And I, just to give it the brief overview, um, I, I'm going to start with the point that, that this type of exceptionalism, I'm just going to use the word exceptionalism rather than a long title, but this type of exceptionalism really is not about, in my view, the absence of social norms, which I think is what it's come to, to uh, be thought of by a lot of people. It's, it's the ability to uh, argue about and create social norms within this community, um, absent some of the sort of draconian uh, imposition of legal norms that exist uh, in real space. And um, so my, my chapter really talks about the role of Section 230 in this, and I don't think it can be understated. It, basically, my claim is that um, despite the fact that uh, sort of the nature of the internet argument or the argument that the internet was ungovernable and therefore would create the ability for exceptionalism, the, the ground for exceptionalism. Uh, 230 provides sort of a modified version of that through working within the sovereign legal system rather than outside of it. And um, I, essentially that the, that the uh, sovereign legal system through the statute has 
created fertile ground, created conditions that allow some sort of modified exceptionalism to develop. And what I mean by that is that the, Section 230 sets the, the initial condition, right? It says that it mitigates certain legal norms, uh, primarily tort norms, um, but also it's... Uh, thanks to the Fourth Circuit and some other circuits, a little broader, it's moving broader than that. Um, it sets some, some it, 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 uh, it mitigates the imposition of those norms, and it allows, by doing so, it allows these, the, the online uh, environment to experiment with new norms. Now, there are lots of good arguments, and I think Frank has made some, and others have made some, Mark has, has made some, um, as to the limitations of my argument, and I'll talk, address those in a minute, but um, sort of my, uh, uh, you know, there's a tendency to think of Web 2.0 as a panacea, and I don't want to say that. But a good example are Web 2.0 communities. And uh, the, the reason that these are a good example of, of this type of exceptionalism working uh, at its, at its uh, utmost is that what we saw lacking in a big way in a lot of the exceptionalist views, the early exceptionalist views, were enforcement mechanisms. Right, that that we struggled with the idea that enforcement mechanisms rest with just a few people, and what these Web 2.0 communities have, through virtue of contract, ironically, given what what Mark writes, um, is not only contract but also uh, obviously uh, code and technology is the ability to enforce social norms, and that creates the ability to cr to have this sort of modified. Uh, uh, this modified market for social norms. And what I mean by that is that, I think Wikipedia is the article I use, uh, is the uh, website I use in the, in the chapter, that given the absence of tort norms within that, or at least you know, for the intermediary, if not for the individuals, the, in the absence of those tort norms, Wikipedia will attempt, using its enforcement power, which it has demonstrated to quite effectiveness at times, um, it will allow its users to develop norms by which speech will be regulated within that community. I think the questions, and I'll just leave with this, I think Mark particularly has raised some really good questions about this. Um, whether or not the law, i.e. the social norms of that community, really will be the norms of that community, or whether uh, the uh, intermediary will overwhelm... The liability questions, it's usually been about ISPs and, and other types of players, but. Uh, talk to us about uh, your views on this, specifically your interesting proposal for an Internet Intermediary Regulatory Council. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a real honor to be on this panel among you know, some really leading experts in the field. I feel a little bit of an interloper, but I, I have been thinking a lot about search the past few years. I think the one way in which I would try to argue about search engines as being unique or that there is, there, well, I guess the first thing I would say is, I think it's very hard to draw draft a law of general applicability to everything. I mean, I, I heard Eric sort of, I think, was jokingly talking about, well, they're trying to carve out a, a world of online dating sites and a world of this and a world of that. Well, I kind of think we may need that. I mean, we may need different rules for, say, a site that gets 5 million visits a week than a site that gets 20 visits a week. You know, I mean, I think employment discrimination law, I think there are, it's, it's, or lots of health law, other forms of law, different size employers are treated very differently. I mean, if you look at the health reform law, almost throughout the whole darn thing, there's just, you know, if you have 25 employees, 100 employees, 1,000, very different treatment. And I think we have to be open to the possibility that different communities, as, as in Brian's excellent work has shown, there are lots of different communities out there, but maybe once they reach a, a certain critical mass, they undergo, uh, or they should undergo more scrutiny. So the idea behind the Internet Intermediary Regulatory Council, uh, Advisory Council or Regulatory uh, Council is, that would help out the regulators here is that when things get big enough, maybe regulators need to understand exactly what's going on within the intermediary. Um, uh, one great uh, article was written by Jeff Rosen about all the people that watch the videos at YouTube. Okay, and YouTube, you know, is, is prides itself large intermediaries pride themselves often on watching what goes on at them, and I think that's a really interesting question, and it raises some very difficult issues about is competition always the solution? Maybe the solution is to have one or two really big intermediaries that we can trust, you know, that can be pretty well regulated like utility, rather than having a thousand things popping up and then having to worry about, you know, well, is the stuff, is the contraband just going to migrate from Google to Schmoogle to Boogle to whatever, you know? Um, and, and so part of my vision that I try to put out there is 
rather than hoping that competition will always solve different problems, maybe there are some places where intermediaries become powerful enough that we recognize there's a monopoly, a duopoly, what have you, and then say, well, they're quasi-state actors, and they sort of act in a, in a state-like role. So, Frank, uh, before I ask uh, others to comment on that proposal, because I think it's a good launching point for a broader discussion, um, do you have you put any more meat on the bones about you know how such a thing would work, who would serve on it, how they're appointed, where it sits? I mean, Congress's role is sure. this the FCC on steroids? Is it something else? I think the key thing is to recognize the limits of expertise at agencies currently. I think that when the FTC hired someone like Chris Segoyan and later when it got Ed Felton, I guess he just started a couple weeks ago, major important good steps there. And I love what David Vladek is doing. I think they're doing, they're really tech aware and they're really trying to invite in more engineers and others. And I think the key is for regulators to recognize their, the limits of, say, what lawyers can do. And this was, of course, what Harry Markopoulos was always saying about the SEC, right? He said, if you want a financial fraud, you can always get it past a lawyer easier than any quant, you know? <laughs> um, and I think the same thing could happen in terms of, of if we don't have regular, regulatory bodies that bring in the economists and the technicians that deeply understand this stuff. That's the key. Bring in this type of advisory council that serves within the agency that can really understand what's going on. Um, on a day-to-day -day dynamic basis. I think that's sort of the key. And in my large article that's in the Northwestern Law Review called Beyond Innovation and Competition, I talk about a private sector alternative too, private sector auditing, like what you see with the National Advertising Division of the Better Business Bureau, I believe. With the FTC, there's, there's entities that are affiliated, uh, that are private entities that try to help the FTC perform its role in dealing with false advertising claims. And 95% of these claims are resolved satisfactorily outside of any formal state legal process. You just have a, a private entity that's trying to solve these things. So I think that's a powerful example, too. Let's get some uh, interplay and input on yeah. this. Um, uh, Mark, you'd like to start? I'd love to also hear from Brian and Eric. Sure. Um, you, you said a magic word of state actor, and I, that, that triggered um, some thoughts. Because I, I, I do think uh, we have to focus on, on, on two developments in the, in the Internet world that, that cry out for rethinking this distinction between uh, private action and government action. Um, the, the one is, uh, and this has been noted before by other people on this panel, and Susan Crawford made reference to it, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a commonplace, but it's worth mentioning. Um, the, 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 the Internet is, is concentrating uh, at just about every single level that you can think of. Uh, there are, are a small number of very powerful entities that basically dominate that segment of the market, whether it's the ISPs or the social networks, uh, the search engines, the, uh, the, the social networks, the online marketplaces, the payment processors. Uh, you know, we, we need, not, need not go towards Frank's idea of reducing competition in order to get a manageable number of people who we can then, you know, give orders to. That's already happening. I mean, it's happening naturally by not by, by sort of greedy megalomaniacs who are, you know, asserting their own control, but, but through the natural forces of network effects, people want to go where other people go, and the natural result of that over a fairly short period of time is that there develop a small number of actors in each of these market segments. Uh, put that together with the increasing willingness of intermediaries to act as uh, controllers of the conduct and, and the, uh, the, uh, the content of their own users. Uh, and you've got a situation that, that sort of reminds me of the way uh, the Yale law professor Owen Fisk used to analyze the speech market, not, not as a problem where uh, the government is walking in to tell a speaker on the street corner, please keep quiet, and that's the paradigm harm. But the problem is bottlenecks and, and, and gatekeepers um, his example was CBS, uh, who, who restrict speech in ways that are harmful to public debate. Um, we thought we'd gotten away from that. You know, the f sort of theme of the Reno decision was that this is a decentralized operation. Everybody's going to be a speaker. So we don't have to worry about the solutions to that problem of bottlenecks and gatekeepers in the first realm of Internet thinking because uh, they aren't there. Uh, well, one of the things we've learned is that they are there and that they are prepared to do things that restrict speech and conduct. And then the question is, what do we do about that? Most of the ideas FIS had are outdated. I mean, it's not, you're not going to bring back the fairness doctrine. You're not going to have, you know, subsidies for public broadcasting equal as a way of fixing rule. this equal time rule. Yeah. But 
that sort of thinking, what do we do about entities that are effectively functioning as state actors in uh, in the internet? What do we do about that, I think, is a, a research agenda for people to be thinking about. And maybe if enough people begin to think about ways we can be creative in this area, there'll be some guidance for policymakers to take forward in the public policy debates. So, so Mark, I'm glad you brought this up. I'm going to turn to, in just a second to Brian or Eric for a response, but it, this is something I personally spent a lot of time on, the question of media access theory right. and the work of Owen Fish, Jerome Barron, Cass Sunstein. Right. I mean, there's a rich history here. Um, you know, part of the response people me has been well the answer to that bottleneck concern or that gatekeeper control is more competition more choice frank uh, has suggested maybe you know that's not all it's cracked up to be we're never going to have enough choice or competition we'll always have certain gatekeepers that need to be policed and considered public utilities so with that as a backdrop let me ask eric or brian to jump in here and say you know what's your response here it sounds like you know the theories you guys have articulated are under attack in a pretty big way eric why don't we start with you um well, I'm interested in the empirics of the question, uh, whether there's been um, concentration at every level. Um, perhaps there's been concentration at certain choke points. Um, but, and I think marketplaces generally have a power law of comp com competitors within it. So um, maybe we're just seeing the natural power law reassert itself um, after a period of wide open um, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, but, uh, you know, at least in the areas that I think about, it, I see lots of competition and lots of new entrants trying to uh, slice and dice uh, the consumer base. And so um, maybe we're just talking about different marketplaces or maybe we're talking about different layers in the telecom stack. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm curious about the empirics of it. Um, I'm curious about Frank's statement. Um, and Frank, uh, I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. What I wrote down was, Maybe it'd be better if we had only a couple of intermediaries, um, but the ones that we could trust. And to me, that that seemed like an oxymoron. Um, I'd like that in the unicorn, please, uh, because uh, you know uh, I start with I'll trust anybody, right? So if we start with that premise, we end up with a real difficulty and say, okay, well let's embrace and extend rather than uh, start with a position of distrust that we're going to um, continue to um, expect. Uh, as, as Adam is suggesting, uh, withering marketplace competition to hold uh, people accountable for uh, their choices. Um, there, it sounds great in theory that, um, you know, I, that if we had the government that we could trust and then we had a bunch of, um, uh, a small number of intermediaries that the government uh, who we trust is overseeing, that we would then get the imputed trust. I mean, that whole chain is rotten at its core for me, because I don't start with the premise I don't trust the government. So how can I trust who they supervise? Before I get a response from Frank, and Brian, would you like to say anything on this point? Yeah. Um, first of all, let me start by saying that uh, you know my focus here is content, sort of a social expression, more than perhaps search engine technologies. Sure. But um, And I'm not an economist, but I do think that uh, we may – not every burgeoning monopoly, to me, is the same, is to be treated the same or conceived of the same. I mean – I am not terribly worried about um, Google uh, because I think the market choice is relatively easy to facilitate there. I am more worried about Facebook. I'm not terribly worried, but I'm more I'm more worried because of what the network effects issue. And uh, but the solution to me is not so much. Uh, oversight is perhaps maybe uh, some effort to facilitate a market in portability, something to that extent. Market facilitation uh, remedies, not uh, necessarily internal oversight mm. remedies. So there's a lot of questions there about where the test would be in terms of determining uh, bandwagon effects and lock-in and things like that. Exactly. But before yeah. we get to that... Frank, do you want to respond to some of what Eric had to say? Sure. And, I mean, and Josh, feel free to jump in here whenever you want. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I just, I guess I would respond. One would be, yeah, I guess it's a voice versus exit issue, right? And if you always think that there's an exit point, then maybe you don't care so much about voice, to use the old Albert O. Hirschman you know, dichotomy. But on the other hand, I mean, Visa and MasterCard, it seems like those are basically your choices. I mean, if they decide to do the same thing, then, you know, I mean, maybe there's Master, there's Discover and American Express, but they they seem to be just sort of hanging on, you know. But um, the other point I guess I would make would be to give you a, a practical example, because I know when I say, oh, I don't want competition, that sounds horrible. But, you know, which, the practical example might be, look at what happened with, say, Juicy Campus. Okay. 
So there's an example where you had, and, and I based this on the work of, of Anne Bartow and, and uh, of Daniel Citron and others called cyber civil rights, where they talk about mm -hmm. there are these cyber cesspools that develop. Okay, And so I'm kind of more happy if kids in general are migrating to Facebook where there are rules and there are certain forms of you know, protection for them, or say MySpace, you know, mm -hmm. which also I think did a good job in dealing with complaints from Brazil about um, child exploitation and other things like that. They had someone review every picture on the website. When you have something like that going on, um, I'm happier to see that type of convergence rather than to see, uh, say, different little sites pop up where, you know, you can have the cyber cesspools pop up and then they fly by night and let anything go, you know. So I think there's a practical example where maybe you do want to see convergence to one well-regulated core or hub rather than constant churning. So, so Frank, it sounds to me like you're longing for large trusted intermediaries who can be good corporate citizens and we can trust them to play the role of a good intermediary, but with a little bit of policing at the margin. From somebody who you've not quite exactly made it clear who that is or where it's at. Um, but let me turn to Eric here um, and, say, and ask him, you know, what, what's wrong with that vision? Does law need to facilitate it? And then you might also want to comment on the whole juicy campus thing, because I know you've written a lot about that. Too. Uh, I mean, it's such a rich discussion. We could go on a lot of angles. Um, I, I guess um, once we have a government instantiated uh, monopolist or um, oligopolist, um, we've frozen in time a marketplace. And we make it so difficult for new uh, competitors to innovate. Um, so. Uh, you know, uh, I think Facebook is a fine example. Um, you know, we say, let's go ahead and dump everybody into Facebook and let them uh, act as our private censors. Um, you know, what will that do to the people who will ultimately dislodge Facebook? And for those of you who think Facebook's the winner, well, let's just go back in history and look at all the internet companies, like Adam was pointing out, <laughs> who we thought were the winners, and 10 years, from, 10 years later, they weren't the winners anymore. Um, so if we lock in Facebook and all of its glory, um, we're giving up a lot. And I worry that by having uh, this be an official integrated uh, solution between government and uh, the private entities, um, that uh, in fact we're, we're distorting the development of the marketplace. Just quickly about Juicy Campus, I will point out the marketplace did drum them out. Um, it wasn't completely neutral of government intervention, but they, they did get kicked out of the marketplace, as did People's Dirt and as did some of these other pop-up sites. Maybe the marketplace does respond to those. We just have to be a little patient. Mark? Yeah, and I, I think my, my students over at Georgetown know all about Juicy Campus. You know they hate it, and, and they're, they're, they're glad it's dead. Um, but on, on, the, on the question of whether we should somehow create monopoly intermediaries, I, I don't think that's the issue. I think the marketplace will do that all by itself. Uh, they're going to be there, and, and we were talking earlier about dynamism, and, and maybe you know we don't have to worry about that because in a few years someone else will come along. Uh, but what you've got in, effectively is a series of gatekeepers. You know, at any stage, you're dealing with a restricted number of very large entities that effectively control conduct and speech. And so you're never going to be at a point where you can say, now we don't have to worry about it. Uh, the question is always going to be, how do you deal with that circumstance where you have fairly centralized marketplaces with dominant private actors? Well, Mark, let's hear you answer that question, because this is really the core of the debate, right? I mean, when do we change the 230 default? Well, I, I, I don't have a good answer. If I had the answer to that, I'd be writing that as a low review <laughs> article. But I, 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 I think the real question is to recognize that the, the, the solutions to the problem that we tell ourselves, which is that if you just allow marketplace evolution, it, it, it'll fix itself. That's, it, it's the first step is to recognize that's not going to be the fix. Let, let me do the empirical question, because um, I, I want to direct people's attention to the work of Matt Hindman, um, who has done a lot of work on the online public sphere. Uh, and it, to some degree, it is just the application of the power law to, yeah. to uh, a, a lot of different uh, blogs and, and, uh, and political websites. Uh, but it, it, it's pretty clear. Uh, when we once thought that there would be a role for anybody who wanted to be a speaker on the Internet, it is now straightforward. The, the top ten news sites in, in, uh, in, on, the, on the Internet are not only dominated by the old line media, you know, they have 80 to 90 percent of the marketplace. Uh, and, 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 the, and the political blogs are no different. 
I mean, they're also dominated by a very small number of very, very popular entities. So, so, so there are gatekeepers. They do exist now. And if they don't recognize you, you literally don't exist in that Internet ecology. But, Mark, I want to push back a little on this okay. point because there's a, there's a, you're using the term gatekeeper here. And I think to some, some of our ears, the term gatekeeper maybe means something a little bit different because in the context of what Matt Himmons, Himmons writing about and others about, look at how many people – uh, are dominant on YouTube or in blogs, you know, the, it's what Eric said earlier, it's a classic power law distribution, right? It's an 80-20 kind of thing. That has been the case in every type of media and communication sphere since the dawn of man, a small number of uh, actors or people getting uh, a lot of the overwhelming uh, audience. I'm looking down at Alex Howard here who's eating into the Twitter world and uh, 50,000 followers where I'm sitting on 1,000 or 2,000. Damn <laughs> you, Alex. <laughs> Mr. Power Law down there. Uh, you know, but the point is, is that I don't look at Alex as a gatekeeper. I look at him as a very successful voice, and it doesn't mean I don't have an opportunity in this new sphere to still participate and to comment and have an audience. It's only an audience of 1,000 or two versus 50 or 55,000, but opportunity does exist. So gatekeeper is a term, I think, wouldn't you say, you have to be careful about that. Well, but let, let me, I mean, you're making my point. I mean, you know, you're saying it's always been that way. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, the media world, simply because of the the economic forces within them, have typically been concentrated markets, and that doesn't. I mean, but, but we e also e go ahead. I'm sorry. E e even before we had, you know, we, we had we had uh, uh, alternative newspapers. You know, it wasn't just the New York Times and CBS. I mean, there were other ways of getting messages out. We had mimeograph machines. We had fax machines. There are all sorts of ways of getting messages out which allowed people who were not mainstream and not recognized by mainstream media to communicate with substantial lar large numbers of other people. But that wasn't the problem that Owen Fiss recognized. The problem that Owen Fiss recognized is that if he wanted to be part of the mainstream debate and not pushed toward the margins and not kept out of the real public discourse, you had to go through those gatekeepers. I, I, and that's still the case. I want to get Eric in here, but I just want to say that in response is I've spent a lot of time writing on this issue. I apologize. I've taken off my moderator hat really quick. Good. The difference is the barriers to entry and the restrictions on who could speak on the soapbox then were very different than they are now. And, you know, when CBS and other major intermediaries were licensed by our government to say, you have so many hours you can do this thing called broadcasting, that's a different world than the one we live in now where any man, woman, and child can create a blog or a website. And Alex, I know you're itching. Go ahead. I'll, I'll allow it. Uh, shout it out. I just, since you brought me into the conversation. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to point out that the top ten blogs online are not mainstream blogs, right? They're not. It's the Huffington Post, it's Mashable, it's Engadget, it's Perez Hilton, who came up before... It's TechCrunch, you know. Good those point. are all creations in the past 10 years, and they're not the New York Times or CBS or any of them, a, although yeah. those old, old school media entities are syndicating them, right? right? I mean, USA Today syndicates Mashable, just right. to throw that out there. Right. So uh, just to push back That's on fair, that, like anyone point. who wants Good. to and can... Eric, with the staff. Eric and Brian are pressing to get in uh, here. So yeah, and, Eric and, first and on that, um, uh, Mark seems to be talking about one model of uh, communication, which is what I'll call, for lack of a better term, the mass market communications. Um, but I'm much more interested in the uh, activity that's taking place in the uh, sub-communities, these little micro-communities. There's just so many conversations taking place that simply never could occur before. And so if we're worried about the mass market discussions, that's fine. That may consolidate to a list of known players, and there may be uh, incumbency advantages from iteration to iteration. But, for example, in the vegan world, there is a very active online discussion about vegans uh, topics that never took place before and that I would argue to you is much more fractured where there isn't a single uh, a dominant uh, CBS of the vegan world the way that we might have thought about in broadcasting in the 1970s. That's great. Uh, Brian, you wanted to comment too? Yeah, um, um, and this may seem an obvious point, but I mean there's a difference between getting a voice and getting an audience. And being and having the ability to do that, and I think just being on mainstream. I mean, the definition of mainstream to me uh, was that you drew the largest, you draw the largest audience, and you mm -hmm. draw this core audience, and therefore you had an economically supportable model, it, su supported by institutions that may not have everyone else's interest in mind. And at the moment, I, I do think there was this massive disruption where you were many people were given a voice but not guaranteed an audience. And many of them have found very good audiences. And many of them are very happy that they have found 
very good, solid, small audiences. And to me, that's okay. I would not expect, sorry, Eric, vegans to draw huge audiences, you know, relative to the population of the United States, relative to the world of vegans. Maybe there's a blog that is just, you know, it's the CBS of, of vegans. Mm -hmm. Um, but that to me, the absence of voices from what, from this, I, and rather than calling it the mainstream media, maybe we all ought to just call it, you know, the middle doesn't necessarily indicate to me that there's an imbalance in the, uh, in the media environment. That's a good point. Uh, in, in a moment, I'm going to go to the audience. We've got a lot of smart people here, and I want to get some questions. I just want to try to bring in, in Josh on a point here and, and maybe get a follow-up from Mark because the, Frank used the term, uh, you know, what do we do about the cyber cesspools? And there's no doubt about it, you know. There's a lot of uh, disturbing stuff that you can find on the Internet. And we have also, uh, I think it's worth pointing out, carved out certain types of activities from this 230 framework. I mean, clearly it doesn't apply to most criminal activity or it doesn't apply to intellectual property, right? I mean, we've got some carve-outs. I guess my question is, how do you deal with the worst of the worst of a child porn, things like this? Um, and is the carve-out model the one that we could end up seeing expanded here as we see a, a movement away from exceptionalism and from intermediary uh, immunity? Is that the way it's going to be done? We're going to go case by case and, you know, grow it in that model? What do you think about that? I think I start with the impression that the Internet is just one aspect of human activity. And the fact that someone's doing something on the Internet doesn't necessarily change our perspective of whether that's proper or not. Um, now, the only thing you add we have at intermediaries is the question of how much they're assisting in the conduct that you don't care about. For transmitting child porn, if they don't have knowledge that they're doing it, well, usually you're not going to hold, obviously, AT&T liable because child porn happens to pass across its network. But if you're having someone who's selling web uh, hosting service and they know who they're selling it to and what's happening, then they might be considered. Knowledge is usually the point where you make the breakoff. Now, are you asking crime by crime, how do we care about, or instance by instance? Hey, let's take it one at a time. I think part of the problem is with a philosophy that treats the Internet um, it's a la, a la Section 230, where say all the torts are now, uh, we're going to exempt you from all the torts. I think probably better to consider it one by one. And consider the arguments like whether it would influence innovation or whether we can make a workable determinant rule uh, tort by tort rather than as blanket. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else on that point, or can I ask the audience for questions? Uh, does anybody have a question? Because I have a follow up on that. Milton. Please uh, stand up, speak clearly, identify yourself, and ask a question. Hi, I'm Milton Mueller of Syracuse University. I wanted to uh, start with a contrast between what Eric said and what Frank said, and I think it has some important uh, overtones for the, for the direction of your center and the whole approach to Internet governance. So Eric said Congress got a law right, and, uh, and I agree with him. I think that Section 230 is an example of a government action that establishes a rule that actually enhances freedom by making it clear what your obligations are, what your responsibilities are, and, uh, and what they're not. Okay. Now, one of the traps that libertarians fall into is that they, they get caught in this regulation is bad, uh, no regulation, no government is good dichotomy, which you always get hung up on. But here's an example of a rule which actually may enhance freedom. You may want to debate this or not. I'll contrast that with what Frank said. Frank wants uh, a public utility model, okay? And as somebody intimately familiar with the history of public utility regulation and how, in, particularly in the telecom area, we got a gigantic national monopoly public utility, man, I'm totally aware of the political compromises and bargains that go into the creation of a public utility, of the constraints that are op opposing, and the paternalism that underlines the philosophy that we can have a good, trusted intermediary that will somehow uh, enact all of these social obligations. So I understand when libertarians are criti crit criticizing government intervention that maybe they're criticizing what Frank is advocating, but they shouldn't get pushed into a position where they're also denying the ability of laws, institutions, and governments to make rules that enhance freedom. Frank, you want to comment on that second uh, part about the public utility argument? Oh, well, I mean, I think that there's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of very important lessons to be learned from the history of public utilities. And I've, I've learned a lot from, from your work on networks and states, and I've learned a lot from, from others, I think, in that area. 
I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I just, my only caution is let's not get into a, a realm where competition and innovation are our only highest goals. You know, I think there are points at which you have to recognize that there is just going to be one entity. And frankly, I mean, I, I'm reminded of, of Tim, Paul DeGreed's review of Mark Wu's, of, of Tim Wu's book in The Nation, uh, where he says essentially, where is the recognition of, of how good, say, certain of these things have done, the good things that these entities have done? You know, the good, we mentioned the BBC in the last panel, we can think of Bell Labs, we can think of other things. I don't think you can sort of write a history where it's all a trail of tears, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I also don't want to be put in a position where I'm just sort of defending every uh, historical sort of alliance between, say, big business and big government. I mean, I think there are ways in which this can be a lot more nimble, and I think that's what I try to get at in my Northwestern article, so, yeah. Braden. Hi, I'm Braden Cox with NetChoice. And um, I'm wrestling with the idea and the concept of exceptionalism because on the one hand, big fan of Section 230 and, and much of what Milton brought up and others have you know, saw, talked about is, is a you know, good thing for free expression and online. But when you go too far with the exceptionalism argument, you, you invite regulation because people think exceptional cases you know, deserve regulation somehow. And, and Eric, you brought up the online dating context, and, and, and we saw with social networking websites, people think you need to carve out certain areas for certain types of regulation, whether it's for kids or things like that, or, or even, um, heck, I was on Good Morning America recently talking about defending online sites because they don't do background checks, but yet people would never assert that for, for classified ads or any type of older technology, right? So what I'm wondering is, why don't we just expand to 232 offline world? Let's just, let's just have that you know, C1 exception work for everybody. Um, so I agree with that. Uh, I am working on a paper that will try to support that principle. Um, and uh, I will be presenting that at the 47 c 230 event on March 4th, where I will try to make that case. Good plug. <laughs> and good, plug for good Morning America, you name dropper. Did, 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 did you choreograph that? <laughs> Anybody want to comment on that more broadly? Yeah, say one more word, that's, which that's is, a pretty important point. Which is, um, I think we've learned something from uh, this experiment with giving the internet this uh, immunized free space. And um, I think some pretty remarkable things have occurred that we would never have thought of. Um, and so that's where I actually come back and say, okay, maybe we can replicate some of that offline because we've seen what a great experiment we've had online. So that's, that's kind of how I get there. Adams. Yeah, sure, Brian. I'm sorry. I think it's actually important to, to recognize, uh, especially in the, in the realm of 230, um, uh, you know, in my article, I use the word modified exceptionalism, and I, I, maybe that's not even a strong enough term, um, because this is a very narrow statute in one way. You know, you, you still have contracts, you still have criminal law, you still have IP law. To me, although it's a very broad grant of immunity, it's, a fair, it's, it's, it's applied to a fair, fairly narrow band of activity. Right? and a fairly narrow band of common law and statutory regulation. So to describe it as exceptionalism maybe has too much baggage in, mm. in, in, in that sense of the historical idea of a completely separate and distinct non-governed or self-governed self -governed, uh, environment. Um, so I think just putting 230 as exceptionalism in play is probably saying a little too much. It's a narrow band of exceptionalism, which I think has been a fabulous experiment to mm -hmm. see what what can occur. And I agree with with Eric. I think the results have been of that experiment, notwithstanding the cesspools <laughs> that hopefully dry up quickly, um, uh, has been very successful. In a I paper that, that uh, while we're doing shameless plugging, in a paper I wrote about four years ago on this question of regulatory asymmetries between the online world and the off. Uh, I try to tear a page out of the world of trade law and suggest that maybe something like most favored nation clause treatment is applicable here where we could find a way to say that you would accord uh, new technologies, new developments, new innovations, that, you know, the least regulated, least restrictive type of approach or framework that is accorded to anybody else in the field to find a way to level the playing field. Because all too often debates about leveling the playing field are about regulating up as opposed to potentially deregulating down. Um, I found that to be a loser with a lot of people. <laughs> they didn't like the sound of that because they said, well, gee, we don't regulate any content on the Internet. And they, the context of this law review article was about free speech, and it was called Why Regulate Broadcasting? And I suggested the way to get out of this mess is just treat broadcasting more like the Internet. 
pretty simple. Um, but uh, everybody else wanted to treat the internet like broadcasting. So anyway, <laughs> when you talk about expanding 230 to the offline world, it, it could be talking about a lot of different things. But the general principle of secondary liability has proved helpful in a lot of contexts. A big one, probably products liability. Uh, you know, you can sue Walmart because the trinket you bought from China hurt your hurt you and the family. Walmart is held responsible for everything it sells, even though it wasn't ultimately responsible for uh, misdesigning the product, as an example. Now, you could say, well, let's get rid of, I don't know that you're saying, that's not put words in your mouth, but that someone could say, uh, let's get rid of that. Let's just say you have to go over to China and sue them there. For a lot of reasons, we have arrived at a position where that's not how we have things. There are other examples where we have found it useful as a society to hold people that are somewhere along the chain, even though they are not themselves directly responsible for all the harm, uh, putting some sort of duty on them to try to make sure that as they move things down this chain, it's not going to cause undue harm to other people. Um, when you focus only on issues such as you know, speech type stuff and uh, slander, libel, all that, um, I think those are increasingly less sympathetic torts in our society. Um, and it's a lot easier to make a case for that. You know, let's, you know, offline, you know, let's go, let's just, you know, ban libel altogether and slander. No one sues under that anymore anyway. Um, but the general principle of secondary liability uh, is, I think, still a very useful one. And it is also a useful one on the Internet, uh, especially for things that are less speech-ish. Just to be clear, I don't think you said this, but to, I don't think 230 would um, cover uh, an online retailer sale of physical goods. So, no, no, no. so I don't think you no, said no. that. But just to be clear, so but where you were going would be, you know, why would uh, the same content that runs um, uh, on Craigslist not be covered under a 230 li like liability if the newspaper published that as a classified ad? Yeah. Other questions here, Steve? You have one. Steve Jobiak with NetChoice. Mark, uh, half the title of this is the intermediary deputization. And you described how the uh, payment intermediaries had taken some positive steps to cut off the air supply, deny payment to certain services, and that it was, I think you said it worked. And, but we should never underestimate the tendency of Congress and maybe IP lawyers to take something that's worked and make it into something unworkable. Speaking of uh, the, the COICA bill, the unfortunately named COICA bill that was reported unanimously out of Senate judiciary last year and will no doubt come back again in the new Congress. It also picked up on Mark's idea and said, we're going to deputize the intermediaries. No payment service can, can, can convey money from an American purchaser to any website that hosts this, con, this uh, counterfeit or infringing activity. But when it went on to say that uh, registries, registrars, name servers, and hosting services shouldn't be able to direct internet traffic to those sites. And then it opened things up by saying that advertisers and advertising networks shouldn't be allowed to spend money with these sites by providing the air supply of ad revenue. And the question for you guys, is that an appropriate deputization? And if so, when does it stop when it comes to cutting off the air supply? Could Congress say that uh, public utilities should not provide electricity and water to an office of somebody that's doing it? And can you go after the pizza delivery boy for feeding the programmers that work there? I mean, when does it stop? To st who's an intermediary and who's not? Steve, you used the term air supply three times. Were you an old fan of the band? <laughs> <laughs> Who gives, buddy? I suspect you do, too, because your paper talks about that. Um, uh, I mean, the way I, if I look at the last 15 years, um, it's been this constant battle back and forth between um, which intermediary we can put on the hook to cut off the bad guys, whoever they are, and whatever they're doing. And so the, it's natural, if you're going to embrace Mark's approach, which I don't, of uh, saying, let's make the payment systems, uh, co-opt them into becoming our private censors. Um, you got to cut off all fund sources of money, right? So you do have to cut off uh, things like the ad networks. They're, they go hand in hand. You have to treat them equally. And so it makes total sense, if you're going to go down that route, to treat them equally. It makes no sense to do either, in my opinion. Um, uh, but we've seen a number of cases in uh, the last six months or so where we're seeing increased pressure on these service providers in the IP arena. And I'll point to just a couple. I'll point to the case that just came out. I haven't even had a chance to blog it yet involving um, uh, an ad network being ordered to cut off servicing a uh, site that was allegedly distributing uh, infringing copies of books. Uh, 
Um, I'll point out the, the Roger Cleveland case where a site was ordered, um, uh, was um, uh, uh, held potentially liable because um, they were providing SEO and web design services to an allegedly infringing trademark counterfeiting site. Um, and of course, then there was the frontline case, which Mark, uh, I think, has written about in some of his work, uh, where the credit card processing systems were held liable under a trademark theory or, or were not disposed of liability um, for providing services to an allegedly counterfeit site. Um, this, this is an ongoing battle, whether it takes place in Congress or in the courts. We're going to see this constantly go. The only way we avoid this, in my opinion, is to deregulate or unregulate the process. That's what made 230 so brilliant by taking that question off the table. We don't see these suits work. We see Ad Network sued for 230-based claims. They could toss out of court instantly. It's on the IP side. We're seeing all this innovation among regulators because we don't create the, the precondition to end that discussion. Josh, do you want to add something? I don't know where we draw the line. Um, obviously, there's one, one, I think the Pizza Boy uh, and maybe the power company, you can start to draw a line at whether what they're doing is providing a crucial service. Um, I think pizza, perhaps not. The power company, frankly, to me, is a bit of a tougher question. Um, but one thing I'd add to it is that the intermediary has to know what's going on, and they have to have the actual ability to stop what's going on. That right there is going to cut out a great deal of the scenarios you could imagine. Does that mean that you could call up the power company and say, you know, one, two, three, uh, Hastings Lane, we're uh, downloading a Metallica MP3 right now, go ahead and cut their power. Um, arguable, actually, whether that would actually stop the download from occurring. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm, op I'm actually open to considering that. There's no knowledge standard in the, uh, in the COICA bill. It says that if Justice Department or court puts them on the blacklist, that's enough knowledge that you need. If they're on the blacklist, Stop feeding them. Stop cooling their offices. I see David Johnson's got a hand up back there. Let's hear from him. Uh, I'm just David Johnson, New York Law School. I'm struck by the fact that <clears throat> you haven't uh, really said very much about what uh, was originally uh, the reason that people thought the Internet was exceptional, and that is that it was global, and that it put people in communication across national boundaries. And the use of the word deputized here strikes me as raising the interesting question, deputized by whom? If half of the users of Facebook are not in the US and uh, we're using the, their network power to set rules that affect everyone else. So I guess my question is, uh, how do you take this set of ideas, what should be given uh, some kind of exceptional treatment and who should be deputized to enforce rules to a global level, and I think it's it's not an accident with, that the cases you always mention are the ones where there is broad global uh, consensus against uh, child pornography or whatever, but when you get to areas where different areas of the world have very different views about what the rules ought to say, how does that work? Great question. Um, Deputi deputization is a difficult term for many of the reasons you mentioned. Perhaps a different question is, who gave Facebook the power? Um, I think Facebook users gave Facebook the power. And if you are a Russian citizen using Facebook or a French citizen using Facebook, by the fact that you are asking an American company for all these services means that if that American company decides to stop giving you those services for some reason, uh, to the extent that that's an exercise of power, it's something that you did yourself. If that, Mark, yeah, the, 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 the key thing about the Internet's uh, global uh, stature is that um, of course local governments have control over the local affiliates of the, the global entities that provide these services and so they can take what is intrinsically a global communications network and reduce it down to you know, a local communication operation and you're seeing this in country after country after country um, that, that that's the fact of the of, of the matter now you know what what is doesn't dictate what ought to be, and what's real doesn't have to be rational. So we have to think carefully about whether this makes sense. Uh, and that's where, when I talked before, we've got to do some sort of really careful cost-benefit thinking. You've got to get down into the empirical detail to see if a particular action by a particular country at a particular time for particular purposes really does make sense. Uh, but I think that's where the fight's going to be at the level of discussion of particular efforts. Because I, th I think governments have learned that if they want to control the internet, even though it's intrinsically global, they can just grab onto a local intermediary and 
there they go. Uh, there was one other question. I think we have time for maybe one more back there. Hi, I'm Jonathan Allen. I'm a lawyer with Rini Coran in DC. I'm wondering, uh, just a question for the panel, if anyone thinks that uh, the FCC's changes uh, with the net neutrality rules have uh, played into a change in the role of the ISP as an intermediary deputy. deputy. For example, uh, the no blocking rule is supposed to allow for a pass through of lawful traffic, and certainly some ISPs at the, uh, at the NPRM stage had concerns that they might be deemed arbiters. Uh, there are references in the new rules to carve outs for Section 230, for example, but I'm wondering if there's been any change in this role based on these FCC rule changes. Mm, interesting. Anybody? Here? Um, what I've seen is uh, that um, the net neutrality discussion has really got everyone else, uh, everyone thinking, where else will we like neutrality? And Frank has obviously been thinking about that and the search neutrality. Like, well, you know, we're talking about net neutrality at one layer. Let's talk about it at some other layers as well. Uh, maybe it's a good idea that should migrate. Um, and so in that sense, I do see this recursive effect um, uh, that net neutrality has had. We weren't having, I think, a discussion about the idea of search neutrality in 2005. We, we didn't have that vernacular. We talked in a different vernacular. Um, and we've seen the conversation change because of the fact that everyone has been discussing this thing called net neutrality. So. Um, it strikes me kind of like the deputization process. I apologize for using the term. Um, but this process is trying to go out and find, well, let's go see who we can, can put in charge of uh, third parties and make them responsible. We're seeing the same kind of nose counting going on in the internet area. Well, who else should be neutral? Um, and in that sense, I think it's a very unhealthy discussion because it doesn't do a very good job about distinguishing between the different layers in the telecom stack. But, but let, let me just uh, try to drill down one layer more because if we got to the point where the new net neutrality regime became full-blown common carriage, you know, regime for internet operators, I mean, this does have a direct bearing on the 230 question, does it not? I mean, there are going to be implications there. I mean, you're going to be expected to play ball differently if you're deemed a common carrier, and therefore maybe policing and liability changes with the nature of your carriage status. Frank, you're itching to say something on that? Oh, just, just very quickly, I mean, I think there's a, there's a really fun... Tim Wu article called um, on Slate called "Has AT and T Lost Its Mind," and it was referring to a fight, th their fight to be able to monitor and do deep packet inspection, etc. He thought should naturally lead them to have the types of responsibilities that they want to evade via t via two thirty. Right. Um, of course, this was responded to by Scott Cleland's. Has Tim Wu lost his credibility? So you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know there's, so there's an interesting debate there. But I think there's a really important uh, balance that has to be struck. And I think my key concern is. Let's not create some sort of super entity that, for some purposes, like maximizing profits, can sniff everybody's packets. But then, when it comes to stopping all these sort of illicit activities, says, "Oh, we can't do that. We can't do that for you." you know? hmm. Well, we'd have time for one more if there is one. But if not, we'll go ahead and adjourn. Um, looks like there's not. So uh, it looks like we're up to our coffee break now. Just about to it. I'll remind everybody that uh, panel three starts at 3.40, so please be back in here. But please join me in thanking this wonderful panel for this discussion. Thank you.